Ruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for attending and welcome to our house. The uh, topic tonight for my thoughts, with all that's going on in the world today, <clears throat> we talk about the coming of the Messiah. So the topic tonight is, are we really ready for Mashiach? Again, Mashiach, the Messiah, are one and the same. So Lubavitcher Rebbe, a blessed memory, said many times before he passed away that we are the last generation before the coming of the Messiah. He contended that, we had, that he had done all that he could do, and the rest was up to his followers, his chassidim. If you look around the world today, there's really no doubt that all the signs of the Mashiach are in the air. All the prophecies about his coming are right in front of our eyes. Social unrest, children rebelling against their parents, barren women that are giving multiple birth to multiple children, <clears throat> world recession, promiscuity. Again, the list goes on. So the question we have to ask is, do we really want Mashiach? Or are we really just totally content with the world as it is? If Mashiach were to call, will we answer or will we just put him on hold? Do we want a world that is more spiritual, more godly, a world that is closer to heaven than to earth? Or are we content with a more earthly existence, with little connection or regard to God and his laws? We really don't want to bother him. You know, it's kind of all good. You know, God gave us his Torah, an instruction manual, is how for us to how to live a spiritual existence in this physical world. He has told us that the only true existence, one that brings total fulfillment to the individual and the world at large, is through Torah and Mitzvot. Torah is all about <clears throat> positive and productive action. It's not about senseless entertainment, video games, sports, alcohol, drugs. It's about change, growth, raising an earthly human being to the level of godly. We can only accomplish this through following the direction that God has laid out for us in his Torah. Joining together with others to serve God with happiness, love, and joy. Is this thought an elusive butterfly or is it a reality? You know, the greatest prophet, the greatest man that ever lived was Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher. <clears throat> Yet, when God appeared to Moshe at the burning bush and commanded him to take the Jews out of Egypt, <laughs> Moshe refused. He told God to choose someone else. What was it that he knew that made him say no to God Almighty? I believe that somehow, some way, Moshe knew that he would not succeed in his mission. Now, what does that mean? After all, if you think about it, Moshe brought the ten plagues on the Egyptians. He took the Jewish nation out of the oppressive slavery in Egypt. He split the sea, brought down the tablets from Mount Sinai, gave them the Torah. He was instrumental in bringing down the mun, the heavenly food, that came again from heaven, the clouds of glory and the well of Miriam. He instructed them on how to build a house for God here on earth, a magnificent tabernacle. He taught them the Torah. He was able to accomplish all these amazing achievements, and yet, still he failed. And the question becomes, how can I say he failed? After all, <clears throat> look at all of his accomplishments. Yes, it's true, Moshe was able to take the Jews out of Egypt, but he was not able to take Egypt out of the Jews. With the least amount of provocation, the nation was ready to go back to Egypt. As the Rambam states, they were a slave nation with a slave mentality. So it was not the Israelites that entered the promised land. It was the children of Israel, <clears throat> their offspring, that merited to enter the holy land of Israel. Try as Moshe did, he could not divorce the nation from its past, not even with daily miracles, not even with the promise of special and elevated future. If we, look at the, if we look at the return of the Jews from Babylon after the destruction of the first temple, you know, we notice an amazing fact. When Ezra, the leader of the nation, came back from Babylon to rebuild the second temple, there were only 40,000 Jews who accompanied him. Millions, millions of Jews remained in Babylon. 
After only 70 years, they became comfortable as Babylonian Jews, with the emphasis on Babylonia. <clears throat> yes, they offered to send their money for the construction of the second temple. But their bodies, hmm, their bodies remained in Babylon. <clears throat> no, you can't buy your way into heaven. You have to be in attendance. We seem to be so embarrassed to stand up as Jews, God's chosen people. I was once talking to a well-educated and refi refined friend of mine. <clears throat> he wasn't Jewish. And in the course of our conversation, I just happened to mention something about being the chosen people. And he quickly retorted. And he said, well, of course you are. The Bible says so. <laughs> a non-Jew. A non-Jew understood this fact better than most of us who are, who are Jewish do. We should be proud of our heritage, not apologize for it. Chosen. It's not meant as an exemption, a free ride, no. Just the opposite. It obligates us to get involved, to lead the world in a better and more godly direction. Our mission, whether we want to accept it or not, is to be a light unto the nations. You know, during the 2008 presidential election between President Obama and Senator McCain, the Detroit Jewish News analyzed the candidates' positions. <clears throat> so they said, if your main concern was for the U.S. economy, then you should vote for President Obama. If your main concern was for the state of Israel, then you should vote for Senator McCain. They then proceeded to endorse President Obama. And I canceled my subscription. How could a Jewish newspaper endorse the U.S. economy over the safety and security of our brethren in the state of Israel? Very sad. The major states that the Brisbane Hapsarim, the covenant between the parts, there Abraham was told by God that his descendants would be exiled, scattered to all four corners of the earth. God also told him that in the end, that they would all return in mass back to the land of Israel. Avram, Abraham asked God, why would they return? Wouldn't they become comfortable in the lands that they would be exiled in? God answered him, don't worry. <clears throat> they will return because of the oppression of the nations. You know, we have been ridiculed, persecuted, robbed, and asked to leave every country, every country that we've resided in. This has been the case even though we have benefited every country that has welcomed us and allowed us to live as citizens of their country. We have contributed to their lives and cultures with innovation, loyalty, and a sense of patriotism. We have supported and been leaders in medicine, music, art, philosophy, science, and yet they still hate us. But why? Is it because of our noses? <laughs> no. It's because of our God. If we convert to any religion, we are accepted, even praised. We are allowed to reach the highest levels of their hierarchy. All we have to do is to denounce our God. But today, do we really need Mashiach? After all, we have our own country. There is a Jewish state. If you are Jewish, you are automatically a citizen of the state of Israel. All you need is the price of an airline ticket, and you can live in the land of our forefathers, the holy land of Israel. We don't have to wait for a world upheaval. We don't need <clears throat> miracles. We don't need anyone's permission. So really, what's all the fuss about? You know, our sages tell us <clears throat> that the second temple was destroyed because of one sin, sinas chinam, baseless hatred. Now, how can the Messiah come when the world is still suffering from the same condition? I wonder if that's what God is trying to make us understand with this worldwide pandemic. There are so many blessings that we have taken for granted throughout the years. You know, God is like a parent. There's no greater pain that a parent experiences than to watch their children fight among themselves. I think that he has said to us, enough is enough. 
This pandemic has taken away our ability to hug, to kiss, to shake hands, even to smile to one another. This pandemic has brought with it much sickness and death, and we can't even feel the comfort of a loving embrace. Even the kind words that we speak are muffled behind a mask. All we have that is not covered up is our ears and our eyes. And again, I believe that God is trying to tell us something. Listen, hear the cries of another person. Let them express their deepest thoughts and pains to you. Just knowing that someone cares enough to listen many times is all that we need. It's an interesting aside that the words listen and silent have the same exact letters. As we say in our most revered prayer, the Shema Yisrael, Hear, O Israel. We all need to listen, not just to God Almighty, but also to each other. We can still connect with others with our eyes, the windows of the soul, the connection of our spirituality. It is the only part of our exposed body that recoils whenever anything physical tries to touch it. Our eyes have the power to express our deepest emotions, some that we consciously do not even realize exist within ourselves. <clears throat> the eyes, they laugh and they cry. The word for eye in Hebrew is ayin. And ma'ayin, like, uh, is, uh, so the word ayin is ayin, ma'ayin is a fountain, which can be seen as ma'ayin, like, like an eye, which can be connected to tears. The tears that come from our eyes can help us to extinguish sorrow, <clears throat> or they can enhance our joy. So thank God we still have our ears and eyes to share with others. But I think that we all pray for the time when we can once again hug, kiss, shake hands, and even smile at each other. Maybe this pandemic will be the one event in history that finally brings us to the point of ending baseless hatred and help us to move into the era of baseless love. But in reality, very little has changed since the time of Moshe taking the Jews out of Egypt. We are still trying, so to speak, to take Egypt out of the Jews. <clears throat> Most Jews in the diaspora consider themselves citizens of the country that they reside in. They call themselves American Jews, with the emphasis on American. It makes little difference whether Jews live in Europe, South America, or the Orient. Jews are true and loyal citizens to the countries that they reside in. Sadly, many times their allegiance is not with the state of Israel. Instead, they feel compassion for the Palestinians, not for the brothers and sisters who live amongst the 70 wolves. I'm neither a Democrat nor am I a Republican. When I vote, the first thing that I look at is who is better for the state of Israel. Then I weigh the other factors. It's a sad reality that the majority of American Jewry vote Democratic. They vote their pocket or they vote for social issues that many times condemn and ostracize the Jewish state. How can we expect the world to accept us if we can't even accept ourselves? This epidemic of trying to be like the nations has even affected the state of Israel. Imagine, Israelis try to imitate the United States with all of its fads and culture. Jerusalem tries to be New York, Tel Aviv, San Francisco, and Elat, Miami Beach. The real question then becomes not how to take the Jews out of the Galut, the exile, but how to take the Galut, the exile, out of the Jews. The word in Hebrew for exile is Gola. The Hebrew word for redemption is Geula. The only difference in spelling of these two words is an Aleph. The letter Aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet with a numerical value of one, an allusion to the one and only God. The word Aleph in Hebrew means general, someone in charge. The Aleph is made up of two Yudin and one Vav. The numerical value of the letter Yud is 10 and Vav is 6. So the olive can be seen as having the numerical value of 26, 2 times 10 plus 6, which is the numerical value of God's special name of mercy that we don't pronounce. 
<clears throat> so this alludes to the fact that we have God, the Aleph. If we have God then we, in our lives, then we have redemption. However, if we are missing the Aleph, then what we have is Galut, is exile. We can think about the coming of the Messiah. We can even talk about his coming in our prayers and in our studies. We can yearn for the time when the third temple will be built on the Temple Mount. But before we can accomplish that miracle, we first need to destroy the idol, the culture of the modern world that resides in our hearts. We need to ask God to help us to remove the baseless hatred that resides in our hearts and replace it with a sincere and deep feeling of baseless love towards all of humanity. And with that, may we usher in the coming of Mashiach Sakeno for real and quickly in our time. Thank you very much for listening. Be healthy, be happy, be safe. God bless you all. Happy, happy Hanukkah. Again, keep the lights burning. God bless and be well.